Welcome to the second Provo Municipal Council Westside Planning Committee meeting. It is 5 p.m. on Wednesday, September. Well, it is 5:17 p.m. on Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, we are meeting in the council conference room, and let's start with a roll call. Louise Jurgensen. Karen Tabaki. <coughs> David Harding. Peter Matson. Gary Winterton. Cliff Strachan. Brian Maxfield. Brian Taylor. Beth Halligan. All right. Um, the first item on the agenda is a discussion on committee membership. Um, we are going to postpone the discussion of that item until the end of the meeting, and we will move into a closed session, a portion of, of the meeting at that time. Um, we don't have Brian here, do we? I've talked to Brian. For, for, for right. I'll we'll, we'll walk you through it. But for, 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 for the reasons, and so we can make that motion at the end. Um, and the other item is a discussion on planning of future meetings and scheduling. So let's go ahead and jump into that item. Um, so the proposal has been made that uh, the meeting of the committee with the additional uh, members of the community uh, could take place every second, second and fourth Tuesdays from five at five p.m. until six thirty p.m. Uh, that would put it on opposite weeks from the regularly scheduled council meetings, um, and that's fairly regular, hopefully we can move through this quickly, but hopefully not too overwhelming to, to any of the schedule. And we'll be moving that into the larger conference room down the hall, with the city conference room. Okay. Excellent. Um, Every other Tuesday, 5 to 6.30. 5 to 6.30. Okay. We'll put it on the calendar for you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <Hey>, Louise? <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it already is, actually. Excellent. And then, and then um, I would like to have the broader um, and the stakeholder meeting um, probably as needed, less frequent, maybe every, every six weeks or so. Um, that way, but more of as needed. So as as this smaller committee um, starts to coalesce around ideas, that we'll be able to, to present them to the, the broader group and get their feedback. Um, as, as the plans are developing rather than waiting to the end. Um, so those possibly could be on the Thursdays, but as needed, Thursday evenings. And there was a proposal to have the first one uh, to be in eight days, which would be the 29th. Which one is the first one? The first which? That was one proposal. A stakeholder meeting? Yeah, the broader stakeholder meeting. <coughs> Welcome to Mr. Connect. Um, we are live and being recorded as well. And uh, we've talked about holding um, these meetings every second and fourth Tuesday at 5 until 6.30. And um, there is a proposal to have our first broader stakeholder meeting um, in eight days. Uh, to me, the, the, the tricky part on that is um, we would need to get the we need to get the word out. Um, it's two days after your first West Side Planning Committee, and that would be open to the public. I don't know that you would be prepared to do both in the same week. Okay, I'm just being realistic from a staff perspective. Okay. But I think we invite them to come to, you know, we it's an open meeting, we invite as many to come as we can. You're talking more like a neighborhood meeting, right? Yeah, but, but so, so my thought on this is these are, these are people, there, there's been a lot of uh, interest expressed from a, a lot of people who would like to be involved. And this is a way that they could be involved more than just if they're not. Um, and, and they would be asked to, um, to do some study uh, between meetings and, and to help um, 
consider issues that, that we're discussing as well. And, and so it's it's a little bit more structured than just a town hall or neighborhood meeting. I think that these would be people that are interested in being involved and are willing to put forth some effort to, to, to do so. Um, how would people feel about the 6th of October? It would be two days after a regular uh, council Tuesday. It's two weeks and one day from today. I have a commitment, but I, I can get here late probably, but I don't know. I don't what? even know. If I, no, I can't make a commitment without being there. Okay. What time would it be at, Dave? Um, I would guess at 5.30. Well, that, that it's more important on the staff. What's the last time you put was time you did one six o'clock? The one you just did was six o'clock? It was six o'clock, yes. And again, this this would probably happen every six weeks or so would be what my thinking on the frequency. So So that one looks pretty clear for us. Okay. Can I suggest that make this one tentative and come with a plan on next week? Make okay. sure we have something we concretely can go to them with. Okay. Because I know that the, the, the exercise that uh, Beth did brought in a lot of information, and I don't think we've had a chance really to go out there. We've got some input, but I think we have to have something to be able to give back and say, you know, these are the things we're looking at. We can narrow it down to kind of policy areas and stuff and then ask for that input at that meeting. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll put together a, a plan by next Tuesday. And then but, but let's tentatively place it on the 6th. Okay. And then we'll decide on Tuesday if we want to move forward with that. All right. Okay. Any other thoughts or uh, things that we want to talk about on future meetings and scheduling? Um, what do what, how do we want to proceed in terms of what we're going to have a meeting on Tuesday and part of that is going to be orientation or orienting our the committee as a whole um, not the committee as a whole committee as a whole um, in terms of where we're at and where we want to go so um, I've anticipated having Brian come and, and kind of give us a world of what is and, and where their planning would go and then the question is, do you want in that hour and a half meeting to leave it to that and organizing the committee, or do you want to actually start inviting groups to come give the first presentation? Um, I had mentioned yesterday the possibility of giving everyone pretty much a blank map, and then, or a black and white map, and, and box of crayons. The committees? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think, I, I, Unless there's other proposals, I, that, that is an activity I'd like to do on the first one. Just kind of um, see roughly where people are at at the beginning. And I would like to see, I would like to see though, what we've got. If we have a, I have heard about the trail system that I have not seen. Yeah. Over the, the map? Yeah. Yeah, it's just in the general plan. I have a bunch of the general plan and looked at that map. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so I think those are two two things that I think we'd like to tackle on that first meeting. Just kind of list out what people's thoughts are, get it down, um, and then second, show what's there now, what are the current plans, um, and what's what progress has been made for uh, on developing these draft plans. So the map would show what is currently developed, and what what would be on the map that would be helpful. To Try and figure out what they would uh, like in, in the remaining undeveloped portions. For me, part of that is knowing who owns the property. Like, if the city owns it, that's different than if I person owns it. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I'd like this to stay at a pretty high level. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, you know, maybe uh, someone's complaining, oh, it'd be nice to have a, a large park here. And, and in actuality, because of something that it won't work there, but it'll work over here. That's okay. We're, we're just drawing with, with crayons and, and just putting colors down, and things might need to So it's okay if we go outside the lines. It's okay <laughs> if we go outside the lines. <laughs> exactly. You can't add X or more spring <laughs> 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 Um Okay. Any other, any other thoughts on this item? 
I think that probably takes up a good portion of the hour and a half. The yeah. two of them. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Okay. We can certainly do that. Okay. Everyone comfortable with that? Every other or twice a month meeting, and I, I, I am hopeful that we can be a good portion of the way done by Thanksgiving and, and have everything wrapped up by the end of the year. Is is, is really. Maybe that's too aggressive, but I'd like to I'd like to shoot for that. I'd like to. If you don't try, you don't get there, right? Yeah, I'd like to see what we can do then. I'll work with Brian. Do you have time tomorrow? Yes. I'll work with Brian tomorrow to try and identify all the relevant documents that we can send to the committee members, and, and then we can, people can, on their own time, do their homework on it. Okay. We have sent some documents out to all of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the draft of the Southwest, Southwest. Master Plan? Yes. Yeah. We'll pull stuff together for you so you know everybody's got the same information to start with. Okay. Um, all right, so now we're into the other items, and it sounds like what Brian's you? here. <coughs> Is this presentation going to be different than what we'll see on Tuesday? Very high level, very high level, very okay. quick. Okay, just kind of tell you where we're at. Can I can I ask committee members and I guess everyone here, you know, if, if we end in 15 minutes, I mean, is anyone going to be upset if, if this is not a long meeting? No, we, we have not. We we are going to go into a closed session, and so I'm going to hold that off as well. Um, so so yeah, if we keep it high level and kind of weather appetite for Tuesday's discussion. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll dive into the closed meeting and see where we can get. I just thought it would be helpful because you probably, more so than I will, will get talked to by people that you know, they've expressed interest and I think it would be helpful just to know kind of what is the status now. I was wondering if that's W-H-E-T or W-E-T on the <laughs> traffic type. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just as background, you know, we started doing neighborhood plans and really the whole city was kind of scheduled out and how to do those the ones we've adopted and this i couldn't get a great copy this didn't print out like it's supposed to so anyway joaquin plan was the first one adopted and from that we established a couple of things one very important thing that's carrying over to all these is the formatting and what we just uh, decided we needed was really a consistent format that goes through all the documents so if you open a neighborhood plan you have a general idea of where to look to find some information to be consistent through the plan. Now certainly the pioneer neighborhoods are going to be a little different because they have historical elements which you're not going to get in some of the other areas. And other areas, uh, probably, well, the southwest plan, for instance, deals with the lake, you know, that everyone else has. So, you know, it certainly changes a little bit. But just so you know, the Joaquin one was adopted first in the downtown plan, and like we were talking about before, this one actually overlaps besides just the uh, central business district neighborhood it actually overlaps into several of the neighborhoods and then the Franklin one which is adopted fairly recently this one is a particular neighborhood much like the Joaquin and then the uh, southeast plan that has been uh, recommended for approval by the uh, Planning Commission it includes Provost, Provost South and Spring Creek neighborhoods together and that was the first real unified plan where it's overlapping neighborhoods uh, Southwest plan was started at the same time and that had that same concept that overlapped neighborhoods just because there were so many common features to those neighborhoods uh, that you're really dealing with. Uh, I think it, it Dave knows this on the southeast, it was the central corridor with State Street and some other features that way, and, you know, well, it was a key tie-in. State Street is what ties us in together because for most of the south on the bench, uh, the a lot of common Spring Street neighborhood other than we uh, are kind of at the same stake uh, and how they change yeah. the boundaries. So we didn't really take in state boundaries as one of the factors, but I know that comes into play. A lot oh, of the input oh, and everything. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah, and that, that's why I keep saying we need to talk to people like state presidents. To the ecclesiastical boundaries or something. I was crucified for suggesting that. <laughs> and, Sorry. But, and, and just to illustrate how important it is, you know, in Southeast Provo, the, the biggest elephant in the room is this huge growing demographic of young professionals that have taken over mm -hmm. the family housing. And, and that was exactly another overlapping factor. And that yeah. did get included in the plan, 
but only at one of our meetings where Bill Pepperoni said, hey, did you happen to know that the state president that's over the singles is breaking the rules? <laughs> and when they get to be 30, they are not sent back to the local wards. They can stay there forever. And so instead of a 25 or the 30 group, we had a 25 to infinity. And it just makes it a bigger problem or a bigger group that we have to deal with. So what they do, what the state presidents do or don't do, can affect us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and, and I think we have to be careful and, and understanding that not everyone is going to fit into some of these um, stakeholder groups. You know, not, not everyone is LDS, not everyone's going to identify as being a mistake. But I also think we need to be careful not to not to uh, consider important stakeholder groups like wards and states and, and elements of our community just because they're religiously based. We just need to make sure that we're listening to all all of those groups and, and understanding that not everyone's going to be part of any one, but, but, but yeah, that, that, that can get feelings. It was, it was, very it was in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides the uh, unique features tying together Provo Bay, uh, you know, there's several other things that, that uh, came into play with the subcommittee when they looked at things. Uh, you know, we tried to bring out every document that related to those. Uh, you know, you have broad documents such as the general plan, but this also gets specific into neighborhoods where you have goals and policies specific to that. And if you look through that plan, you see those were highlighted uh, in each of those. And, and again, realize that's a draft. There's some places that you'll notice are way out of place. They're, they're just kind of thrown in there to, to eventually fix later. Uh, the Vision 2030 update, you know, was put into that also. And then the, uh, probably more than any other area, we've got a lot of other old uh, plans in there. We've got the airport master plan. And uh, these are, I think, are all online that you could, could find. I keep finding more parks and recreation plans than I knew. But airport master plan actually was scheduled for update in 2018. And, and so there are, you know, some other ones that are, are uh, specific to it. There were, were study Utah Lake Jordan River studies, uh, the Utah Lake Master Plan that was done by the, the county and the cities, and uh, you know historic areas. And, and so all these plans were consulted by the subcommittees, and they're tr they were tasked with really familiarizing themselves what's been done in the past. We, now we didn't go to all the old plans that have ever been done, but really what's kind of current, what gives current information and background. And then like parks and recreation, that I seem to have gotten multiple copies of, that really are citywide plan and it's a little different because it doesn't identify new parks. I know that's always been an interest in Lakewood and, and some of the others do just show us where these parks are. But really what they're doing is, is giving your service areas. Is, so these are covered by ball fields, these aren't, you know, and, and really kind of coming up with areas. And so as the, the plan developed in the southwest, you know, there, there are lots of things taken in. We have, you know, like when the subdivisions came in that are color-coded and different things for population and how did, how did the area grow, how did it develop, and then looking what the trends were. And then the subcommittee kind of pinned some things down. But as they pin things down, unique, I think, you mentioned one in the southeast that is important on the policy. This one ended up with like five different policy things that were major components. Ag preservation, are you going to preserve ag land or not? The FEMA maps, you know, where FEMA is looking at changing the insurance, how much does that play in? Uh, the city, through this Provo Reg Plan, looking at a regional park, you know, there's only a couple places left where we can do that. And, uh, you know, how does that interact? Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, a couple of other factors that come into play. But what the committee also did, and I think this was a direction really from the council too, was the solid assumptions were commercial grocery center down on, on Center Street in Geneva. How many rooftops do we need to make that viable? Uh, the airport of, of looking not necessarily, we have an area that's called airport expansion area on some maps. It's not really an expansion of the airport. It's it's the uh, areas where you can't put residential. You know, it's more protected that way. Uh, and so the, the city looked at a business park of that on the east side of the airport uh, through that area. Uh, you know, some of the LDS Church Farm and the Hinkley Farms down through that area. Uh, and that just seemed like the practical locations that we did those as assumptions. 
But again, now we end up with other conflicts because if you do an ag preservation area, well, that's kind of an important ag preservation area if that's indeed the purpose of it. Uh, is it? And so it's really almost comes to one of those things of how do you spend money. The other one was the trails, in fact, because the committee really emphasized trails, the connection factor that's in the general plan. Mm -hmm. How do we connect? Mm -hmm. what was this is a subcommittee that was formed uh, they, when they had the initial neighborhood, I mean, this in 2014, they, they kind of picked people from the neighborhood and then all the neighborhood chair and then uh, large interest of property owners. Some of them sent their representatives, like D.R. Horton, that was had a contract on 100 acres or more. And so several of those attended the meetings, too. And uh, the thing they, they came up with, like uh, looking at the, the written goals and policies, then trying to translate that out on the maps, one of those was the trails. You have a major trail system that's being put in with the, the parkway. But how do you now bring that back into the neighborhoods, back to tie the schools, to tie the commercial, you know, so people can use instead of having to get in your car and drive to the trail to use it. And as they did that, then that's where the pushback started because of, of money and, and policy things. Okay, how do we put those in? How do we maintain them? You know, that's a nice trail system, but where does they're not revenue producing. The same with the big regional park, the same with a lot of these other decisions that really came down to, okay, where's the council want to go on this? Are they willing to commit themselves that this is indeed going to happen here? That now will allow us to plan out these scenarios. And if you look at that, there are kind of five initial scenarios that were developed. The first one say, okay, let's, let's do ag preservation and just chunk out areas. The second one was a little variation of that. It said, okay, chunk out areas. It, oh, I'm sorry. It also breaks it down whether it's for floodplain or for ag preservation or other other reasons. And really, you've almost got to come up with a pretty solid reason instead of just, hey, this sounds good. Uh, but the second one really said, okay, let's remember we're trying to get enough rooftops for the commercial. How do we transfer density off that onto other areas to give us the same number of rooftops we would have had had that developed residentially? Then the third one, status quo, where it basically shows residential for most of that area, four units per acre per development. The fourth scenario was saying, okay, in reality, the commercial minimum is really what that density is. Is it, you know, some of those densities drop off as children age and neighborhoods age and your population actually decrease a little bit. Do you need to build in enough cushion so that it's a very solid viability? to the commercial. If so, you need to add another couple thousand rooftops. The, the normal one's like five to seven for a grocery store, so would you go seven to nine thousand or something like that? Therefore, do you need to build up like the new intersection areas next to the parkway or, or other things so that you've got areas that aren't invading neighborhood? And in no case, by the way, were we talking about higher density housing? It wasn't apartments, it wasn't anything like that. But how can you get enough density through some of these areas that is related to that viability for the commercial area and makes sense. So you're not introducing extra traffic in the neighborhoods as more of where the traffic would flow because of the new roadway and some other factors. Um, and so, you know, utilizing those as, as kind of the, the linchpins, how do you now work these scenarios around? Then the fifth scenario was saying, and, and probably even matched a little bit more where you went one time, David, with the, the sustainability of our systems. You know, how close can we get to the O&M costs on our, our utility maintenance? Are there places where you could build up density just otherwise? And, uh, oh, I should back up. The, the fourth one also looked at an overall density of four units per acre overall rather than two projects. So you would compensate for areas that were less than that. But... It, the emphasis on that one was always to do large-scale developments, uh, Broadview Shores and some scope, and I think that's mentioned in, in a couple of the goals and policies of these uh, existing general plan. Uh, you can have different types of mixes, but don't just all go high density. There would also be some larger lot areas, too. You know, the, the, there's trade-offs, but it gives you a, a variety of home sizes. So that's kind of where it leaked into, but then it got to be because of the utility questions on, on the sewer lines especially, uh, how many hookups do we now have? When, when's the trigger point for the new system? Because utilities, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, but then it became one, well, or do we build a whole new, whole new facility out in this area? 
rather than just pipe it over to the other. So now you've got a, a factor that wasn't even in the initial considerations. And then it would be much easier to determine these policies first to focus our where we're going with the strategies rather than if we just shotgun it and then say, well, that's never going to happen because we've never adopted that policy. Instead of spending all this time coming up with scenarios that couldn't happen anyway, kind of, or, or weren't agreeable anyway. So uh, that's where we were. We had the, the initial draft of this was actually done last August, and then we started tweaking it, and, and because of changes in the format then all, uh, and the utility issues coming up that led from one thing to another, we tried to get it done again like in March of this year, but then it just kind of, of became these policy issues just uh, that we really said, if we don't have those, we're spinning wheels. And so there's a quick synopsis if that works. <laughs> and, and the hope is to cut this down from the 65 or so pages it is now too. You know, you want to make it readable and workable at the same time, but this also does not get into the pure imp implementation. The third element was always to go general plan, a little more specific with neighborhood plans, and then an implementation stage, which is, this is the one you can measure and check the boxes. Have you done it? What's a schedule to getting it done? And and if you notice through here, there are a lot of, of general plan issues which have been done and could be checked. And so it also kind of goes a little bit backwards to say, okay, what general plan goals have been met? Which ones are still valid we need to emphasize and then maybe which ones well that sounded good at the time but you know maybe there's another thought on that one southwest so it was just three neighborhoods or oh four? i'm sorry it's fort union provo bay sunset and lakewood so the four okay which provo river and i-15 which is what we decided was going to be our scope for this committee at the last meeting but we decided That's fine, but I, I, I hope that we realize there may be pockets of property in the areas of the north that we still well, ought to. Yeah, our trails are going to connect. To the uh -huh. We understand all that, I think. Well, and, and yeah, I, I'm thinking there's one dairy farm left on the west side. Mm -hmm. Is that up in the northwest pocket? I understand that uh, they have. That's and, and, and Lakeview, both north and south, is going to be part of another master plan that's being put together. But you certainly set the parameter with your policies here, yeah. and you can follow them through when you update those. Exactly. And you could even do a parallel one, or how, you know, many ways to do that. Can you? Can you? If you take a policy, say on agriculture use, mm -hmm. can we? Can we just append that as like as a as a we could do as a topical issue so you would know how it apply to the rest of the city also. Uh, even as far as the foothills to to Edgemont to every other place if you if you want to do that. Uh, and so a lot of these things, you know, you almost break out as, as an area topical thing that applies to several others. It's kind of like the recreation plan overlaps, but you can get very specific to your area also. That makes sense. Can I ask a question? In the, in the contiguous areas that are Known as farmland now, how much how much space are we talking? We do have that number somewhere. <laughs> is it is it the thousands? Is it the hundreds? The, it's hundreds. Okay. I, in my mind, I'm. I'll look through there and see if I happen to find one that has something like that written out on it. See, these are all our scribble copies. So we're figuring those things out on. And I do have some. You don't have to answer right now, but I think that'd be. Curiosity. Well, I'm looking at this, and I, I would say that the airport's about 800 acres, so it's okay. the amount of developable land here is roughly two to three times the Broadview Shores. Okay. I, I don't know how accurate that is, but well, it's kind of eyeballing it, and I think that kind of gives us an idea that. Okay. I'm thinking it was 600 to 800, somewhere in that. And Broadview Shores is really only. Three or two, two eighty, I think. Well, then, then his number's right. So, so the, the, the question, Brian, uh, as we consider what is developable, and sometimes I hear the west side in general is being developed uh, at four per acre uh, as the average. So, south of the airport connector, what 
Has that been included as the four? No. That's open. Okay. Uh, no development. What can you say about it at this point? Because I know that some of the farmers are unhappy they can't farm it anymore. What's right. the future of it? Well, we've looked at a couple of things. One, the city did end up purchasing quite a bit of it. Now, you, you have also some farms such as some of the Hinkley land that extends halfway across Provo Bay. Uh, and so it's almost equating some kind of a value that you could transfer density rights to another. You're not just saying, hey, yeah, you're out of luck. If it's not developable, how does it have density rights? You're right. And so that's there are some areas on that, that south side that you could, as far as its elevation and, and you can do things to to address floodplain, but you've got problems with servicing utilities. You've got, you know, you can't do septic, you can't do whatever. So that's a real question as to what they can do. Certainly, they can farm it, and you say, you know, we're never taking that right away. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> what are you transferring? I don't know. The question uh, is, yes, farming. Mm -hmm. That's great, uh, but is it practical to build? Uh, any homes, like five acre minimum, uh, small farms with a house on it, uh, or is the sewer and utilities just insurmountable? I think David probably knows that, but I, I know the, the septic systems are not allowed. Right. So There's no way around it. Five that. acres, it probably is it. It's an economic <laughs> thing, you know, can yeah. somebody afford to take all of that infrastructure out for just five or six homes? And pump the sewage back. Yeah. And if somebody thought that that was feasible, then we would work with them to do that. It's just, in our minds, it's like we're thinking there's not going to be anybody that's going to be willing to do that, but maybe there will be. But uh, so, so say there is someone who says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'll put in the infrastructure, and then like most, most developments, then ask the city to take over the maintenance of that going mm -hmm. forward. Is that something that the city would say, well, we do it, we've done it for other people, we're going to do it now? Or, are we gonna, or would the city say, for the amount of property taxes that we're going to get from this, there's no way it will cover 25, 50, 75 years in the future. You know, this is just going to be a, a suck on resources. And, and so the only way you can do this is if you keep that private and, and we're not going to be responsible for that. Uh, uh, some places there have. There's a lot of that evaluation that goes in. Mm -hmm. So there is some evaluation. To decide how to handle that. Um, the, the, the one council has that opportunity to give us direction too. Is how you know how much direction you want to give us? Is how much burden do you want the city to take on or private sector to, to do? Um, we have that. We have currently. A, a uh, gentleman who wants five acre lots south of that new road. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't yet seen how he plans to service that yet, though. so it's just right now it's kind of there's how it would lay out and this how location. do you get utilities to it? It's the one who owns Ovation. Right. It owns the ground that Ovation is buying it from. So it begs the question since we have someone that's kind of interested and we have people at the meeting on the west side who said, hey, I'd love to do a farm on five acres. Mm -hmm. If the area below the connector road is available for farming at five acre, 10 acre, 20 acre, whatever we determine, um, that's just something that needs to be explored. Yeah, and here's they the- They have to raise their, their habitable or elevation probably three to four feet above that existing grounds to the south. That right. area, or just because that's our our minimum elevation to get above the floor plane. And, right. and so here's so the other be some of that, you know, and I see you know a house kind of filled up and then rolling back down into some farmland. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the other thing to think about is farming five acres is different than living on the piece and farming it. Uh, you know, it's much like when you have a, an RA zone with a half acre animal rights. Gee, if you've got horses, a half acre, you got a little pin in your backyard by the time right. you build your home and things. And so it's almost like what's really feasible and then, you know, do our homes actually on that? And, and yeah, whether that's feasible to people would travel out and farm five acres that they can't live on, you know, 
Well, and that's why I brought With animals, up, yeah. That's why I want to know how many people, how many homes are feasible out there, what it takes so people can actually live out there, yeah. which makes it more inviting. And in a lot of places, too, a lot of cities have done it just as a, as a fallback, that they always give a number that you can build on. So like even in the far areas, you can build on one per 40 acres. Right. And it doesn't evaluate what the ground is. It says when you build, you've got to build on certain ground. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other caveat would be, okay, if you can show you've got some buildable area that could do more than that, uh, but it was always trying to look at a way to compensate somebody that if you're willing to do a conservation easement or some other form, that way we would at least give you something for it, you know, and, and how far we go. That's one of the problems we have because really the general plan says up to four units per acre. But everybody takes it all of a sudden that it's four <laughs> years per acre. Or beyond. Or beyond. Slightly beyond. And so, it, and it's very, it's much more workable on a 100, 200 acre piece of land to mix the densities mm -hmm. than if someone comes with a half acre mm -hmm. that now expects the max density on a half acre. And so, you know, that's why there was implied in the, in the general, well, actually, very specific, I think, in East Space, but it says the more area, the more we would consider. And I think that's what we've looked at, as because there was kind of a parallel need to develop a, a, a plan, much like Broadview Shores or something else, but what would regulations be that would determine density, and much of that was based on acreage. The biggest, more acreage, the higher densities you could go. Mm -hmm. Just because you have some place to put it, and, and you can arrange it so it's less impactful and things like that. But um, back to that four acres, four units, Kind of where are we get that number from? Because that was going to be developed for our master plan for all of our utilities was based on that four units per acre. That you know, if you said we want you know five units per acre, we'd have to go back and reevaluate that, see what impacts the system would have. Um, but right now, all of our main lines that are servicing that area are sized so that they can handle uh, 40 units per acre as we expand out. If we were to, you know, say raise that five or six units per acre, then we have to go back and replace main lines way up the line. So it's not just a linear cost, it's exponential. So and actually, yeah, figuring so out. We're it. really nervous about going beyond that 40 units per acre because of the cost. But It'd be, it'd be good to know how much of that is already in the ground and how much of it is still on paper. Yeah. And, and that's why some of the scenarios, like even scenario one and two, which was looking at preserving things, saying, okay, we're now not having to build certain collector roads, we're not having to extend services in that area, we're shortening up our service areas. Uh, we realize that could also resize some lines and things. And so that's where you've got to play these things back and forth. So, okay, that sounds great, but you understand there's a cause and effect. And if you do that, now we've got to compensate over here or something. Yeah. We have some uh, really good maps that we've already produced uh, that maybe you guys would like to look at. One of them was uh, developed as part of that West Side Connector. Well, actually, that's a, a confusing name, isn't it? <laughs> the name of the road is Lakeview Parkway from from University Avenue all the way up around into Ormus. That'll be the name of the road. The name and of the, the project the signs on the freeway now. <laughs> it's on the freeway signs. The name of the project that built the Lakeview Parkway was the West Side Connector project, so it's yeah. interchangeable. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, Cliff. Um, <coughs> We wanted to end this at quarter two, it's now <laughs> six, and some people have to go, but um, I'm sure we're going to revisit a lot of these issues. Yeah. So, All right, yeah, me too. Can I make um, one question? We have a lot of maps we can supply you with. Is there a time when you would want those delivered to you as soon as possible? Or yeah, I'm thinking if we could get them Cliff, okay. Soon, and it sounds like you're going to be sending us some information in preparation for Tuesday. Yeah. And, and so let's talk tomorrow morning if you guys okay.
Yeah, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll start pulling stuff together. I know that he wants to uh, suggest having uh, a fairly blank map so that they can talk about you know, the crayons and draw on it a little bit and see what. You know, one of the maps that's really good is we show what property west of the Lake Park the city owns and what's mm -hmm. private land. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a good visual. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay. So at this point, you're looking for a motion to close the meeting uh, in order to discuss the character and competence of possible committee members. And then you would close it at the end of it, you would come back out before you close the, the formal meeting. Okay. One question, did we get that noticed? No. I mean, that's like can't have a closed meeting. You didn't need to. It's, we, do it, we do it as a matter of uh, uh, comfort on, on the regular council meeting, but I checked with Brian, he was fine with it. Oh, I'm, I'm looking for that motion. You've got it. Excellent. Ms. Winston, seconded by Mr. Connect. Uh, all in favor of going to the post meeting? Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming.